today on the Perception in Action podcast. Should we be striving to make everything in practice as close to the game as possible? What is the difference between specificity and representativeness? And do we care at all what an athlete's movement solution looks like? So it's time for a call to action. Hi, this is Rob Gray from Arizona State University. I've been on a now over 25-year journey as a researcher, professor, and high-performance consultant to understand how we acquire and adapt our perceptual motor skills. Welcome to the Perception in Action podcast, where I discuss how psychological research can be applied to improving performance, accelerating skill acquisition, and designing technologies. Before we get to today's topic, I want to tell you about a couple extra things that might interest you if you're enjoying the podcast. First, my book, How We Learn to Move, A Revolution in the Way We Coach and Practice Sports Skills, is now available in audiobook format. You can find it on Audible or Amazon. Second, if you're interested in working directly with me, I currently have openings in my monthly mentorship program. This includes monthly Zoom meetings, either one-on-one or with your staff, analysis of your practice designs, and a monthly group discussion with coaches and instructors from a range of different sports. To find out more, please go to patreon.com forward slash perception action. Now on to the show. Hey everyone. In today's episode, I want to do something a little bit different. I thought I would just riff on something, right? I'm just going to kind of talk off the top of my head rather than having some prepared research and notes and things like that. Um, This is kind of inspired by my, you know, I just got back from recently from the Baseball Skill Acquisition Summit. Um, in Florida, put on by Randy Sullivan. It was great as always, a lot of fun. Uh, I learned a lot. Um, but through it, I, there was a couple kind of topics that arose that I wanted to dive into a little bit and, and share my thoughts, right? So these are not, you know, I'm not trying to, you know, convey what's in the research on this or the true definitions of things. I'm trying to convey my thoughts and how I'm thinking at the moment. I hope you find that useful. So at the Skill Acquisition Summit, you know, we we did a bunch of presentations the first day, and then we do a bunch of practicals the second day, as always. And, you know, the presentations the first day were focused on, you know, Franz Bosch spoke, I spoke, and a lot of the the people, Bart Hanegraaff, uh, Martin Nyhoff, that kind of apply some of Franz's ideas in baseball spoke as well. And then we did things on the field. One thing that's kind of coming across to me within the ecological approach is there's starting to be kind of slightly different camps about around the idea of how much we actually care about the movement solution that people are coming up with when they self-organize. And I'll start off by saying I think this is a great, you know, it's great to have different concepts and ideas and and doing things. So for me, there's kind of three different camps that I can see coming. The first one is uh, what I'll call positions, right? And this is the traditional view of the correct technique, right? The idea that to be skillful, we have to have the body, there's certain patterns of movement we have to have. We have to have, th- we have to extend our knee in this way. We have to bend our elbow that much, right? And this was something Franz was talking about a lot in his, his presentation, you know, the idea that you know, we can derive these from biomechanics analysis. So in, in baseball, for those that don't know, there's a big kind of innovation in a couple, with a couple different technologies where we can do in-game biomechanics now. So all, all, some teams have terabytes of data of elite pitchers and elite batters and how they move. And we're trying to derive from the outside what are the, the optimal movement patterns. You know, this amount of knee bend, this amount of flexion. And Franz is... You know, key point he was making was that you can't really do that, right? There's too much going on, right? We need to look from inside. And, you know, he was talking about putting the bio back in biomechanics. We need to understand why these patterns are emerging rather than just looking at them from the outside. There's too many knock on what he called knock on effects, forward and backward acting effects in movement. You know, and I talked a little bit about this uh, last week with the kinematic sequencing to say that this particular position is optimal, right? Whether this position works or not in the movement, right? Having a straight back leg or a bent back leg depends on what happened before and what happens after and on the person's anatomy. So we cannot simply look at the outside and look at positions. And there's some things we can drive, but we can't, you know, 
pick out the perfect movement solution, right? So the ecological approach and ecological dynamics is really moving away from this positions idea, the idea that movement solutions have to have certain positions, right? Then, so what we've moved to a lot of us, and this is kind of Franz's and his group's view, is the what I'll call conditions, right? So there's not particular positions we have to have. Your knee doesn't have to be bent or straight or whatever angle, but there's certain conditions that we need to meet if we're going to have optimal movement and reduce the chance of injury, right? You know, if you know anyone that knows Franz's work, he's identified these conditions, what he called, you know, he'll, he'll link with attractors, you know, having foot plant from a foot plant from above, having a hip hinge, doing a proximal to distal movement, right? So, so he has these, for him, these conditions that must be met in order for effective solution to occur. This is probably where I fall as well, I'll admit. You know, I think there, I call them invariants, right? There's certain elements of a good movement solution that we can identify and that we can coach towards, right? So we can guide the athlete to, to these kind of having these properties or, you know, increase their capacity. And this was, you know, really interesting how my talk, if you listened to the episode a couple of weeks ago, aligned really nicely with what Franz and the other speakers were talking about in terms of developing action capacities, right? So it was, it's critical. This helped me understand. I talked to Franz a lot about this, you know, when he's talking about developing a hip hinge, he's not prescribing a particular movement, right? He's not saying that your hip needs to do this much or this angle, Right. What he's trying to do and with his, his kind of exercises that he does in the, the weight room in the gym is trying to give you more of a range of possible hip angles, right? By extending your range of possible movement solutions. And then we're going to put you back in and let you self-organize. The amount of hip angle and hip flexion or whatever you need to use, there's no value we know. That would be a position, right? We're just giving you more range so you can find what works for you. Really, that's so it's still a very much a self organization approach. The focus on it is on giving you more capacity um, to and more uh, options for self organization, right? That's that's why uh, what he's going on. Okay, so that's the the second view, the conditions. At the other end of the the spectrum, I think you know I would call it you know self organization purist approach, right? And this is really what you know people like Wolfgang Schulhorn are promoting. He's arguing that. There's no actual correctness to a movement solution, right? There's movement solutions ha are constantly varying, ha are very different, right? So there's no, you know, thing we can identify that you have to have, right? You're gonna all we can do is keep giving you problems and allow you to adapt, right? So that you can adapt to the new problems in the game. We can't teach you this condition that you need to satisfy because there's not any, right? And I'm seeing there's, beyond uh, Wolfgang Schulhorn, there's a group of people that are starting to kind of adopt this approach, right? All of the practices designed at the the environment, right? The, the constraints, right? We're going to uh, change the affordances, change the variability, and in no way are we going to talk about your movement. In no way are we going to try to guide you in a certain mo movement pattern other than by changing the information or affordances. We're not going to try to directly get you to step further or bend your knee more or anything like that, right? We we completely want it. There's nothing that we care about. We're really that we can identify has to be in there in the movement. So we're just going to let you self-organize on your own, right? So that's the other extreme. So I think this is, as I said, is a really interesting kind of division and, and you know, different camps are seeing. And, I, and I'm interested in kind of seeing how this evolves, right? This, whether we want to... Um, step in and do anything about the movement pattern. And let me give an example of what I mean, right? So um, in in the, Bart Hanegraaff, who's now with the Pittsburgh Pirates, was doing some really interesting hitting activities, right? And so he had a batter up there taking swings and, and they had a pitcher, you know, throwing him a ball. So, you know, nice coupled representative design. And, you know, Bart was, Bart was showing, you know, what he would do with a, a batter who was kind of rolling over on their front foot. Okay, or slipping on the front foot. In the extreme self-organization purist camp, right, we wouldn't do anything, right? We don't care, right? As long as they're hitting the ball solidly, um, we don't care. We're not going to try to change their movement pattern at all. Whereas what Bart would do and what he did was he put 
a ramp on the ground by, by the batter's lead foot. So when they stood on it, they slid down the ramp uh, or rolled over even more um, So if they weren't planting the foot from above. So he was trying to push the athlete towards this condition of planting the foot from above, right, by adding a constraint where essentially he was feeding the error, right? So if you weren't doing that, it was going to make your movement worse, right? So he's he's trying to manip- directly manipulate the movement pattern, right? Not just the information, the affordances, and the constraints. He's trying to use a constraint to directly manipulate the movement pattern. Another really interesting one he did was, <coughs> you know, players where he thinks the movement of the o- lower body, you know, is not meeting some of these conditions, what he had them to do was hit cross-handed, right? So you change your hand position on the bat where your lower hand was B and now your top hand is. What happens when you do that? That constraint makes it hard for the batter to ad- adjust to the position of the oncoming ball using their hands and arms because, right, they, they don't have as good much coordination. So they really have to focus on getting the lower body there, right? So this is, you know, what I, you know, I would call, you know, condition-based coaching, right? We're, we're a good example of the constraints-led approach, right? We're adding a constraint to try to move you to a certain area and solution space, right? We're not just throwing, you know, a whole bunch of different conditions to get you to explore the movement space all over, right? We have an idea, these conditions, where we want you to be, right? So that's what, what he was doing. That's what I do a lot of myself, Right. Um, so, but as I said, it will be interesting to see kind of where people lie. You know, I, I think, like I said, there's a group of people that would say, I don't care what you do with your front foot. Right. Um, as long as you're hitting the ball solidly and, you know, I don't care. I'm not going to worry about your movement pattern. I'm just going to give you lots of conditions, lots of different variation information, lots of affordances for you to adapt and to be able to take those into the game. Right. So that's the one um, how much we care actually care about the movement pattern is one interesting thing that I saw. The other thing I wanted to talk about in this episode is looking at the concept of representative design, right? Um, so again, I'm not trying to go back to Brunswick's definition and, and the, uh, what's written about it. I'm trying to talk about what I think, right? And I'm seeing some things, you know, this kind of view of, you know, what I want to talk about is, you know, the, the first thing I want to talk about is, you know, sometimes we hear expressions like the game is the best teacher and we need to keep practice as close to the game as, pro- as possible. I think that's, a, that's actually a very misleading way to put things because the game, in fact, is not the best teacher, right? It's not uh, the best way to develop skill at all, right? Just letting people play games and games over and over. Yes, you will, but it's not the optimal way that we can do it, right? There's a bunch of problems with games which make them not the best way to learn, right? They're not the best learning environments. One is, you know, the level of challenge is not always great, right? It can either be way too high or way too low. Um, you know, it varies. Um, the number, the the uh, kind of information and the affordances are not amplified. There can be very quiet. Well, by that, I mean, you know, the opportunity, the space opens and then it's gone, right? So, um, and there's so much going on in chaos that we're not, kind of focusing, you know, people on to, to pick up certain things and doing that. We're not guiding them at all. <coughs> Excuse me. And then, you know, so that there's that problem, you know, and then, you know, you don't always get good, fee- have time to process feedback about what you did wrong, you know, what happened. So, um, you know, and we're really, and also, you know, we're not targeting practice at what you kind of need to work on. So it's not really deliberate in the sense, you know, Anders Erickson's sense, right? So I don't think just letting people play the game is the best way to develop skill, right? Obviously, it's a very important part of it, right? Letting you put your practice, but we need to move away from the game at times in practice to help you to learn better, right? So the game is not the best teacher, in my opinion. It's not the best environment for learning, Right, it, it, it's it's the best environment to show what you learned, right, and show the transfer of learning, but it's not the best for actually learning itself, right. So, we need to step away from the game, right. And this addresses something that I see people talk about. You know, the difference between what I what I would call specificity and representative design, right. So, specificity for me, again, there might be a different definition in some paper in the papers, but specificity for me means 
how similar is practice to the game on kind of every level, every superficial thing you can think of, right? Is there a screen in front of the pitcher in a game in baseball? No, right? There's no safety screen. So that's a lack that's not similar, right? Is the, going back to Bart example, is there a ramp on the ground in front of a batter when they're hitting in a game? No, right? So specificity refers to having, you know, the, the, the what's similar between a game and a, and a practice, right? And there's kind of this kind of false interpretation, I think, that representative design and specificity are the same thing, right? In order to have representativeness, I need everything as much as possible the same between practice and the game, right? And obviously that's difficult to achieve and then you're going back to what I just talked about, right? If we, if that was true, then the, the best representative practice we could have would be playing the game itself, right? Which I was just trying to make the point is not the best teacher. Representative design, so specificity is having everything the same. Representative design, for me, is having a few key features the same, right? Having, the, making sure that there's certain key things that are there in practice that are also there in the game, right? And beyond that, we're allowed to change things for either out of uh, you know practicality because we can't do the things in the game like a screen in front of a pitcher in a baseball practice is there for safety. Yes, it doesn't give the batter the same information, but you know out of practicality. And the other reason is we might want, uh, deliberately changing things from the game environment in the practice environment can be purposeful and useful, right? And Bart's ramp example is, is, is the example of that for me, right? Where the ramp is serving a purpose. Yes, it's different than the game, but it's trying, we want to be different than the game for, for that reason, right? So what, what needs to be there for, to have representative design? For me, there's three things, right? And people also talk about other things like emotional level and, and, and things like that. You can add that. But there's, for me, there's three main things. One is information. The information you're using to control your movement, in practice, we want it to be similar to the game. Right? We want, if your, your practice involves hitting an approaching ball or catching an approaching ball, which has information like tau and things like that, we want that in the game, right? We don't want, uh, you know, and as much as possible, we want it to be similar, you know, similar, uh, you know, coming from the similar angles. We don't want you hitting off a tee in baseball because, you know, the, we don't have any information there. You're not adapting to any information. Hitting from a ball tossed by a coach standing close to you underhand is, you know, has some of the same qualities, but it's not the, the same type of thing you're picking up, right? So one, we want as much as possible, you, we need your movements to be information driven, you know, i.e. keep them coupled. And we want the uh, information to be similar. You know, sometimes the term we'll hear is specifying, right? And I'll, I'll talk about, I'm going to talk about that more later uh, in coming episodes. But we want the information to be there. Whatever you're using, if you're, um, you control a ball to get around based on the opponent's body position or their movement, we want the opponent's body position and movement there in practice, right? We don't want you driven around a cone. Um, if you're attacking in a combat sport based on the, the, what the opponent's doing or defending, we want that there, right? So the information, what is the information? It obviously doesn't have to be exactly the same, but the key, you know, key features there, key basic, you know, principle, what's there? What, what source of information? Is it spaces? Is it approaching objects, you know, so that, that idea for me. So one is information. Two is task dynamics. And sometimes I use the term action fidelity for to this. Two, we want you moving and constrained in your movement in a similar way to the way that you're going to move in the game, right? So if it, it involves, you know, moving, so to, you have to, coordinate your body to swing a bat, then we don't, we want you swinging a bat, right? We don't want you throwing a ball to practice swinging a bat, right? There's different constraints. Also, this, this comes into play when we're talking about, you know, kind of 
the, the, the speed of the movements and things like that. We want you to, relative to your level, right? We want to, you to have similar time demands on time, time demands on the task, on the movement. Similar body parts have to be coordinated in similar ways to produce the movement in the practice that you're going to produce in the game, right? We know that movements with very different task dynamics don't transfer at all, right, to, to the game. So we want to have similar patterns of movement, similar body parts, similar degrees of freedom, uh, similar, you know, temporal and spatial demands, right? We can scale that down, but we, we want to have, you know, have some temporal. A lot of sports have, a lot of practices have no temporal demands. By that, I mean, you could take forever to respond, um, whereas in the game, obviously that is not the case, right? And we'll, I'll get into it to that, that more as well. The third thing for me is affordances, right? So in plural affordances, there have to be opportunities for action in the environment, right? Multiple ones. So much of practice we do, right? It has one affordance, what the coach is telling you to do, hit the ball, right? Um, we want to have multiple affordances, right? Hit in the open space, try to, you know, get on base, try to drive it over the defense, try to, you know, so we want to have multiple affordances. Obviously, that's critical for decision making, right? Shoot, pass, carry, drive the ball. We want to have all these uh, multiple affordances available to the athlete. We want to have both positive and negative affordances, right? We want to have, you know, consequences when we, when we, do this, the other team gets the ball. When I swing like that, I strike out, right? When I try to hit the ball, maybe I hit the ball super hard, but the defense is shifted over there in baseball and I hit it right at them, right? So I need to be able to perceive the affordances. Um, I'm, I'm varying my intention. I'm varying the information I might use. I'm making decisions, right? So if we have all those three things there, the information, the task dynamics, and the affordances, to me, that's the most important part. That's way more important than any consideration consideration of superficial similarity, right? Um, you know, so sometimes the I get people, well, you're using a weighted ball, you're using a lighter bat, you're using in pitching a, a ramp that goes up instead of down. How is that going to help someone in the game where the, those things aren't in the game? Well, for me, the key is within those practices, we still have those three components. And we're deliberately manipulating constraints to make a better learning environment, right? As I said, the game is not the best teacher, right? We want to manipulate the practice environment so it's a better teacher. It amplifies things, amplifies information and certain affordances, right? It gives better feedback. So, for example, in baseball, we use these uh, kind of plyo balls or what are sometimes called smash factor balls now. So when you hit them, you get more information about how you contacted the ball, right? When you miss hit it, you get you can really feel it and the ball goes differently. Is that not representative design because you don't use those balls in the game? Yeah, it is. You're still hitting, you're still the task dynamics there's information is there, the affordances are there, we could have fielders. But we're augmenting the information. Right? Think about some of the words that we use when we you know, talk about coaching and the ecological approach, right? We want to amplify, augment overload, challenge, extend, right? All those things are implying we're not doing what we're doing in the game, right? We're going beyond the game. We're, we're trying to optimize a practice environment. We want you to learn. We're not trying to make you move exactly like you would in the game, right? We're giving you these new problems, right? So for me, you know, sometimes I use the phrase taking a slice out of the game, right? So what we want to do is, you know, we want to design these problems in the practice environment. For me, it's completely okay. And in most cases, it should be different than the game, right? We, we want something different to help you work on something, right? And, and, you know, those words I just used, amplify, extend, exaggerate, overload, augment information, things like that. So we really, I think that's a key point. point. The a goal of practice should not always be to get as close to the game as possible. That for me is not what we mean by representativeness, right? And some people talk about a scale of representativeness, like, a, like it's, you can go from really unrepresentative to, to very like, close to the game. I don't really, you know, know how useful that idea is for me, right? 
all I, you know, all I want really is those three principles there, right? If I satisfy those three, information, task dynamics, and affordances, then for me, as long as you have a good reason while you're doing something, while you're having someone throw on an up ramp versus a down ramp, while you're using a, a weighted ball versus a regular ball, then I, uh, to me, that doesn't make it less or more representative, right? For the purpose of practice, learning, right? Working on someone's, you know, identifying a weakness and working on, on that. To me, things closer to kin the game, you know, I don't think we are, are worse, right? They're not, if, you know, maybe, so having this scale where closer to the game is always better is not, I, th I don't think is, the, I think is the wrong idea, right? We, having those three principles satisfied is the right idea. And then having things that are different than the game for a purpose is the right idea. And we don't always need to be trying to strive for higher represent representativeness. Okay, so that's kind of some thoughts I had. You know, while I was actually kind of kind of doing this and recording this, um, actually um, there was a group on of, of people you that I've talked to. You know, in the past on the podcast, let Philip O'Callaghan, who's a, a great uh, tennis coach and has a great blog that you they should uh, you should follow. He kind of uh, initiated a Twitter Spaces discussion about representative learning design, and and Stuart Armstrong published it as a podcast episode on the Talent Equation podcast. So they're kind of talking around some of these these same ideas but um so um if you're interested i've added a link to that in the show notes okay so to kind of summarize you know uh, these are some of my kind of random thoughts on these ideas but I, you know i think you know we want as a coach you want to think about how much you care about movement right is there do you care what movement pattern are you going to try to guide the athlete to a certain solution or a certain area of space where the solution will be or are you going to let anything goes? And the other kind of point, you know, this this representative design, right? Representative design, you know, in some ways, I would prefer to think of it as a binary thing than a <laughs> than a scale, right? Because I, again, getting closer to the game is not always better, right? It's often not better at all because it's not the best teacher. It's not the best learning or practice environment, in my opinion. The key point, though, is asking why am I being different and, and what is the purpose of this difference? And, and that, that's the kind of what, what I think about that. Okay, that's it for today's episode. And, and thank you for <laughs> enjoying. I hope you enjoyed my little off-the-cuff riff. Uh, we'll, turn, we'll return with more regular, researched, and structured episodes uh, next time. Thank you. Okay, that's it for today's episode. Remember, you can contact me at robgray at asu.edu or follow me on Twitter at shakyweights. To find out more about the podcast, please check out perceptionaction.com. Finally, to support the podcast and receive bonus materials, including written transcripts, please head over to patreon.com forward slash perceptionaction. This is Rob Gray from ASU. Cheers for now and keep them coupled. Gone straight away.